Tonight, we continue our series, Finding Peace in a Chaotic World. We all need peace. We've talked at length about how we live under such stress. We've been talking, the first part of our series was just the theological understanding of how to have peace. Let's just show you what these subjects were. Peace with God, identifying unhealthy patterns, transitioning to healthy thoughts, talking about how we can continue to develop healthy thoughts in our life, and then learning how to forget. That means also how to forgive, how to establish the mind of Christ. And then last week, we began just some very practical things with how to have peace in our schedules. Today, as you can see, we're talking about how to have peace in our finances. Anybody need that? All right. When the world is chaotic as it is today, it's strange how we pay attention to so many things. And it's strange how many prognosticators come out and they say, the same person that predicted the fall of the bank in 1902 is predicting the fall of the bank today. And there's all kinds of things. We, we pay attention to what the barrel of oil costs because that drives so much of our, so much of our economy. And we think about we think about all those things, and a lot of times, not only do we think about the safety of the world, but we think about the economy and how that's going to impact us. Have, have, you, have you paid attention at the grocery store lately? It is stunning to me. It's stunning to me how much a tube of toothpaste has gone up in the past few years. It is easily doubled for the same amount of toothpaste. How about... How about deodorant? Have you noticed how expensive deodorant is? I've given up on deodorant. <laughs> That's why everybody's sitting so far back. No toothpaste, no deodorant. And bay leaves. <laughs> I don't know how you can afford bay leaves. <laughs> so we see these things and they, they cause us stress. And so we want to talk about how to have peace in our finances. One of the great causes, leading causes of divorce is financial problems in the marriage, in the home. One of the leading causes of suicide is financial problems. Financial stress leads people to financial crimes. And so over and over again, stress in finances causes all kinds of fallout in our lives and certainly in our world. So we want to talk tonight about some keys to finding peace. Now, you can listen to Dave Ramsey every day, and he's going to give you a lot more than I will, all right? But I want to talk to you about five principles, five keys for how to find financial peace. And I really hope that you pay attention, and I encourage you, if you want to, take pictures of these slides because you have friends and family members who need to hear these truths. And you might be able to share that with them. All right. I'm going to ask. Adam, would you lead us in prayer as we begin our time together, my friend? Amen. Thank you, Adam. Didn't Adam do a great job Sunday? That was fun. He did almost as good as Theo did. It was, it was good. Uh, Sunday, we talked about 2 Timothy. And we talked about how Paul was handing off the baton passing the torch, so to speak, to Timothy. We talked about the area in a race where one racer finishes, the other racer, racer begins, and we call that the what? Does anybody remember what you call that? The exchange zone. And First and Second Timothy are exchange zones for Paul and Timothy. And so you can see here where Paul is giving Timothy all kinds of letters. These are personal letters. These are letters to Timothy. These are not to churches. These are instructions to his, to his uh, young Padawan, uh, Star Wars term there. And he is, he is helping him become a servant of God and a servant of the church. And it's interesting that he talks about finances in his instructions to Timothy. So we find ourselves in 1 Timothy Chapter 6, verse 6. And let's, let's have somebody volunteer to read that nice and loud for us, 6 through 10. Thank you, Jim. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a spectacular passage. 
Now, here's, here's what I'm tempted to do. I'm tempted to just give you everything that I learned. But really, what I want to do is I want you to practice digging these truths out yourself. So here's what I want you to do at your table. See if you can find in there some keys to peace. And then we'll see how you did. All right? We'll see how smart you are. So see if you can talk about it at your table. If you're at a table where you don't like the person you're beside, move to another table where you can carry on a conversation. And see if you can come up with some principles yourself in this passage. Go ahead. All right. Has anybody found a principle from this passage yet? All right. I heard both uh, these two tables say the same word. What was it? Is that what you said? Look how content you are holding that baby right there. Would you introduce the guests at your table with us today, beginning with that handsome fella right there? Girl. Handsome, handsome girl, beautiful girl. I knew I'd do that. No. Nice to have you with us. So right now, she's content. All right? If you didn't get that one, that's in there three times. You need to learn how to study your Bible better. All right? Let's look at where it's in there. Godliness with what? Contentment. Now, it's not contentment by itself because there's a lot of lame people in this world who do not have godliness, and they're content just to lay around and not do anything. That is not what we're talking about. Godliness is what we talked about last week, making Christ the center of your life and, and, and fixing your schedule. And here it's going to be your finances around him. All right? But godliness with contentment. Now, how many of us have learned this lesson in, in number seven, in, in verse seven? We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. What's the old joke? You never see a U-Haul following a hearse, right? You cannot take it with you. <laughs> now, the pharaohs tried to do it. They tried to take everything with them. What happened to that? It ends up in a museum. If, if, it's, if they're fortunate enough for it to make it there, because a lot of them were just robbed, right? Grave robbers. You can't take it with you. And so you brought nothing into this world. You can take nothing out. Boy, that will strike you hard when you lose a loved one. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with what? Now, how many of us, let's be honest, how many of us are content with food and clothing? All right. Go ahead. You're exactly right. She, and she was happy. She was happy. Her, her world kept getting smaller and smaller. And she had beautiful furniture, and then she had to give that up and went to smaller places and had to give that up. But she was content and, and again, happy. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. What a good lesson that is. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So the key to financial peace, the first one is what? You said it? Contentment. Godliness with contentment. And so that's great gain. How can that be great gain? You're satisfied and you're peaceful. What do we think about, though, when we think about great gain? More money, but more than that, it's the things the money buys. So when we think about great gain, we think about things. But what thing has ever made you happy for very long? A puppy. A puppy. <laughs> How about... How about have you ever watched a kid on Christmas morning? Now, I know the Sullivans don't get their kids any toys at Christmas, but uh, the Stutlers would get their kids a few toys. Ken, you remember getting some toys at Christmas? Uh, Ken, I'm going to tell you, we, we were bad parents. They would get way too many toys at Christmas, and it was very painful because we were up all night long getting those toys assembled, etc. cetera. And, and then they would come in, and you, you, you're sitting there in your mind. You're doing the little calculator. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. They would come in, and they would look at something, and you're going, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. And then what would they do? Throw it down. 
play with the box. And so, and so things don't tend to make us happy. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they're, they're fun. It's get your, get your kids Christmas presents is what I'm trying to say. But we learned a lesson in that things don't really matter. I can remember as a child, I remember getting some things at Christmas that I, that I enjoyed. But what are my great memories of Christmas? You know what they are. Being with Grandma and Grandpa. Being in that place. Right? It's that feeling of being at home. It wasn't the things. Again, I got some cool gifts as a kid. But that's not the memory. The memory is the people. The contentment. This article from Time Magazine called The Real Truth About Money. If you made a graph of American life since the end of World War II, every line concerning money and the things that money can buy would soar upward. A statistical monument to the materialism. Inflation-adjusted income per American household has tripled. The size of the typical new house has more than doubled. A two-car garage was once a goal. Now we're nearly a three-car nation. Designer everything, personal electronics, and other items that didn't even exist a half century ago are now affordable No matter how you chart the trends in earning and spending, everything is up, up, up. But if you made a chart of American happiness since World War II, the line would be flat as a marble tabletop. I think about that. I did the research a few months back thinking about this very topic. And after World War II, the average home size was less than 1,200 square feet. Today, the average home size is more than twice that. And we think we're really sacrificing something. And so think about it. How many of you remember having one car when you were growing up? All right. Can any of you remember having one horse? (laughs) I hope not. But how many people now? There's very few that have one car. All right. And so the world has changed, but our happiness hasn't. So what's the moral of the story? Money can't buy me happiness. All right. Hey, I think about this verse in Philippians. Philippians is full of so many good things. Look at Philippians 4.10. Who would read that for us? Now, he said he'd learned the secret. Let's see if you can figure out what it is. Go for it. What do you think it is? Talk about it at your table there for a minute. What's the secret then to being content? What is it? Trusting the Lord in all circumstance. All right? Trusting the Lord. So the Lord is at the center. Contentment begins with godliness. Right? Godliness and contentment go together. And so here he's saying, I can do all this, whether he, whether he gives me little or whether he gives me a lot. I'll be content because he is sufficient. He is sufficient. I have what I need. And so we think, we think about our lives and we think about how many times we're not content. And yet, if we were a Jew being carted off in World War II and put on a train, how many of us would be content to be on that train if our whole family was with us? Or to be content in that, in that barracks if we just had a little food in our bellies? And a blanket. But more than anything, how awful would it be to go through this life without knowing God as our as our Lord? And how how blessed are we to have Him? So contentment. Let's talk for a moment because we really don't have this next thing figured out. All right? Let's talk about our need versus our want. Now, Paul says this to Timothy, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. I asked you earlier, who was content with just food and clothing? Let's be honest again. If you just had food and clothing, how many of you would be content? But if you were a prisoner in World War II, how many of you would be content with food and clothing? It's based upon what you have and what you don't have, right? And so if you have nothing, food and clothing would be all all you think you would need. And so let's talk about the difference between a need and a want. I've listed them up here. Here's, here's a need. A need makes life possible. 
and a want makes life easier. Would that be fair? How many of us have trouble making life possible? Is there anybody even here in the Nashville area that doesn't have life as a possibility? How many of you have gone down and volunteered at the rescue mission? What can, you, what can they get down there? Food? Shelter? Clothing? They can get medical care if they need it. There's a lot that you can get there. Now, I'm not saying that they should be content, but many of them, if they're in 10-degree in, in weather and they're able to get there, they would find great contentment. And so we need to differentiate between what makes life possible and what makes life easier. And what Paul is saying to Timothy, if we have what makes life possible, then we ought to be content. Now, he's not saying it's a bad thing to want other things. He's not saying it's a bad thing to have other things. It is not a bad thing to have other things. You do not need to be guilty for having a nice home or having a decent clothes or having a, a nice vehicle or taking a good vacation. Those are all gifts from God. Amen? Those are all good things that God has blessed us with. But if you think that you have to have more and more and more of those things, you are lacking contentment. And so we move on to a second key to financial peace. All right. I'm wondering if any of you discovered this in our passage earlier. We talked about contentment. Did you discover any other things in our passage earlier? Ah, very good. Look here. Key to financial peace. Number two, don't love money. All right. Money can't buy you love. <laughs> don't love money. Now, look at what he said. This is an interesting warning. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Isn't that a mouthful right there, just in verse 9? And so what is the love of money doing to people? What are the, what are the things that are, that are happening here? Temptation? Then they become trapped? They're foolish, they have harmful desires, and they're plunged into ruin and destruction. When's the last time ruin and destruction didn't bring you stress? And what's, what's causing their ruin and their destruction? What is it? They want to get, they want to get rich. Have you ever thought about that? Yes. 9,700. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you live below that. Half the people live below that, right? And so if you, live, if you have more than that, you're, you're better than half the population. Now let's go back to this really quick. Those who want to get rich and you see the downward spiral. Because what is, what is the desire to get rich? You want more, more, more. What do you want more of? The, the definition of rich is what? Power, but you want more money. And so if you desire to bring to you more money rather than more people or more of God or, or more service to your fellow humans, you are loving money. And so he goes on and he says what? You know this one. For the love of, he does not say money. Why not? Money's a tool, what'd you say? It's the love of money. And here's the interesting thing. I would, I would be really reluctant to preach this if it weren't in the scriptures. He is really taking a bold step when he says it's the root of some evil. Think about it. The love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of. Because what, why would the love of money be the root of all evil? Because you're replacing the love of God. And you're putting, you are thinking, here's what you're doing when you, when you love money. You're thinking that money is your provider. You're thinking that money is your security. 
you're thinking that somehow money can buy you eternity. And it can't. I, I can't speak to that, but I don't know that I've heard it. But it's very popular to appeal to an evil heart with a promise of riches because we naturally want that. And so what we do is we say, well, God can get you money, but the end isn't God. The end is money. Think about it for a minute. God is the step to the money. Do you, do you all agree with me or disagree with me? Do you see what I'm talking about? If I'm preaching prosperity, I'm telling you that you go to God in order to get to the money. And so what's the heart's desire in the end? Is it the love of God? Is it the righteousness of God? Is it the holiness of God? Is it to do the will of God? Is it to even suffer and for Christ's sake? That's not the, that's not the goal. The goal is to get the money from God. And therefore, we have to be very careful. I'm not passing judgment. I'm just saying that I have to be careful how I preach because the goal isn't the money. The goal is God. And if you're using money to try to get people to God, you are doing the wrong thing because they're, gonna, they're only going to use God in t until they get what they're really wanting, which is money. You know, you, you would capture children and sell them into sex trafficking because what are you loving? You're loving money more than you love humanity. So I go back again. I just want to make sure that we're clear on this. I, I believe that God takes care of his people, don't you? I don't believe there's anything that our God can't take care of. We're going to talk about that in a moment. I believe that God blesses people. And I believe every one of us in this room are experiencing his blessing because we're all above that $9,000 a year mark. But let me say again that we have to be extremely careful about making money the end and God the vehicle to the end. And that's a lot of times where the prosperity gospel is. The end is the money. And God's simply a, a means to an end. Yeah, what was the, what was the lottery last week? $1.75 billion? I immediately got mad because I realized that the government right off the top would take 24%. I got mad. And then they would tax me at 37%. I got really mad. And the lottery, they would only give me the $1.75 billion if I won, if I took it over the next 30 years. Well, 30 years is a long time for me. And so I started figuring, I don't know if I could live on $450 million. <laughs> and, and, I, and I started to spend it. And I started thinking, you know what? I, I think I'd start a record company and Adam would be my first guy there. That, that would probably take about, you know, probably $10 million, $10 million. And I, I started to go through, you know what I do? And I, I, I you know, I would like to really... I, I think there's just some evang evangelistic causes where, man, I'd like to just take $100 million. But, and I started going through it. I didn't have any left. That airplane took the last bit of it. And you're right. You're right. We probably wouldn't handle it very well, would we? Yeah. I really honestly, Matthew is the king of bad jokes. You think I'm bad? I, I really thought you were going into a joke right there. I thought it was going to be something. One of them got a leg up. One of them got a leg down. I didn't know what it was. But thank you for sharing that bit of information. You are very good at that. But if you didn't hear what he said, he said that they did a study and people who had an amputation had the same level of distress as the people who had won the lottery. All right. So just, you know, thank the Lord today that you didn't win the lottery. Jim, what were you going to say? What was that TV show Sam Walton was in? Oh, the Waltons. Is that what it was? All right, let's move on. <laughs> Vince, Vance Pittman said this, and see if this makes sense. If we're not content with what we do have, then we won't be content when we get what we don't have. Now, right there between the G and the T, I'd like to buy a vowel. But uh, if, we, if we're not content with what we do have, then we won't be content when we get what we don't have. There's a lot of truth to that. A lot of us want more and more and more. But think about this for a moment. Can money buy your identity? 
not the right kind. Can money be the source of your purpose in life? Can money be the source of your happiness, Matthew? Can, can money be the source of your status? I mean, it, it, it might, you might be a rich person, but, is that, but does that status even matter? Jesus says many will come and say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, what, I depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And what will there be there? Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so what can be the source of your identity? What should be? God, what should be the source of your purpose, Pam? God, I waited till you took a big bite. What's the source of happiness? What's the source of your status? And so this is where the love of money replaces the love of God, and it just doesn't work in all these things. It's only God who can bring us satisfaction and contentment. And so we, we should love God, not money. And we shouldn't love God just to get money, because that means we love the money more. Right? Let's look at this again. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But look at this last part. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. This is in the day of Paul. But how much more in the days of Wall Street and online trading? And pierced themselves with many griefs. Today, honestly, we live in a more secular society than we've ever lived in in the United States of America. And what is the pursuit of most people? It's money. And so money is leading people away from God, away from service in the church, because here's what they think. If I go to the church, I'm going to be giving up this time that I could make this much. And so it brings them many griefs. And so we live at a time when there's more wealth than ever. By the way, there's not a limited amount of wealth. Just because one person has billions of dollars doesn't mean the next person down the road doesn't have any. Because wealth can be created. It does, there's not a limited amount. That's a, that's a misunderstanding. But here's the thing. We live in a time when there's more wealth than ever. And yet, is there, is there ever been a time when there's been any greater misery? And we see it all around us. Greed, yeah. And greed is, a, greed is a step to all kinds of evil, as it says. Here's number three. Are you ready? Key to financial peace number three, manage God's money well. But you, man of God, verse 11, we didn't get to this one earlier. Let's look at this one. But you, man of God, Paul talking to Timothy, flee from all this. What is all of this? The love of money. All right, all those snares, all those things that he's just talking about, you flee that. What does it mean to flee? Can you give me an example from Scripture where somebody fleed, flew? Joseph fleed from Potiphar's wife. He didn't just kind of mosey on out the door. He ran out, left behind his coat. She's coming on to him. He said, how could I do this to my boss and to my God? And he ran. Here, Paul says, you've got to run away from that kind of temptation for riches. Now, this should speak to us, because if you want financial peace, you've got to flee from the desire of having more and more. And instead, what should you do? You should pursue, say it together, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Earlier, Matthew, you said those are what? Fruits of the Spirit. And so don't be filled with money. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't be satisfied with the fruit money can buy. Be satisfied with the fruits of the Spirit. And enjoy those. And so let's look at this. Let's break this down. Flee from what things? The pursuit of riches. The love of money. And what do you pursue? Godliness. Righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. The fruits of the Spirit, so to speak. Does that make sense, everybody? Now, let's put this into practice. All right? Whenever you're tempted because you don't have as nice a car as you want, what do you pursue instead of the money that you want to get that car? You pursue God. You seek after Him. 
You follow after him. You pursue him. You pursue righteousness. You, you pursue godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Those are the things that you pursue. Those things will bring what? Peace. Now, this is predicated upon this fact, and let's look at this together. God has a plan for our lives. Is there anybody that would argue against that? He saved you for a reason. He's had a plan for your life from eternity. He wants certain things for you from you, and he's going to bless you when you pursue his plan for your life, which means that he also, by extension, has a plan for your and my finances. Did you ever think about it that way? So God gives you a paycheck for what reason? His reason. That's exactly right. We often think God gives me this so I can do what I want with it. But really, God gives us our finances to accomplish what he wants to do in our lives. So when's the last time you ever got a paycheck and said, Lord, what is it you want me to do with this? How is it you want me to utilize it? One person said it this way. We oftentimes think, Lord, how much you want me to give? When we ought to think what? How much dare I keep? And so listen to what he says in verse 17. Casey, can you read 17 through 19 for us? Can, can your wife, can you, will you read it, Bonnie? All right. This is your application. Why don't you see what you can draw from this at your table and then share some things with us here in a moment. All right, go ahead. This is our application. This is the command that he's giving to Timothy and to those who are in his presence. See what you can draw from this. Okay. Boy, this has a lot in it, doesn't it? So let's see what you discovered in here. Matthew, what did you guys find? Okay, so don't place your trust in wealth. What do our coins say? Who is smart enough to put that on there? That's smart. And God, we trust. We don't trust in the money. I remind you that in Zimbabwe, they used American dollars. Their dollar is the same amount as our dollars. And in Zimbabwe, the, the uh, economy went so bad that people who had millions of dollars in the bank would take millions of dollars to go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. I literally have a Zimbabwe trillion dollars, and it's useless. Now, how would you like to retire with several million dollars that was the same value as it was in America, and then all of a sudden... You have several million dollars and it won't buy you a loaf of bread. You, you need a billion dollars. And then you have a billion dollars, but that's not enough. You have $999 billion and what you need is a trillion. How would you like to have that? Don't trust in money. Good, Matthew. What else? Lisa, what did you guys come up with? Humbly. He did. He, he lived in the same house he had lived in for years. What, somebody look up arrogant. All right. Somebody find a definition for arrogant. There you go. Don't have an exaggerated sense of your own ability or of yourself. What would you say, Nathan? I don't know what version you're looking at there. Not Vanderbilt football fans, for sure. Now, not to be arrogant, self-sufficient, not, not, to, not to exaggerate themselves, because we praise God from whom all blessings flow. What else did we find in this passage? These are applications. What'd you find? Put your hope in God. That's a contrast to putting your hope in money. In God we trust. Put your trust in God. Your money will fail you. No matter how much you have, as we talked about, it can fail. But what? God never fails. All right, what else? Where, where do you find that at? To command them to do good. That's right. That's, that's take what I've given you and do good with it. All right? I've heard of churches where they give everybody $100 on a Sunday and they say, go do something good with that. Do not think that that's happening here anytime soon. All right? But uh, what would you do with it? All right? What would you do with it? And so command them to do good. What's the next one? Uh, how about that? Don't be rich in, in, in money. Be rich in good deeds. That's a really good saying, isn't it? That'd be a good one to put on your refrigerator or your mirror. Don't be rich in money, but be rich in good deeds. And then we get something that comes straight from Jesus himself. Be generous. 
That should be the command of all of us. Here, here's, here's what. I, I have no idea who gives what. I have no idea who doesn't give. I don't know that. Gail, Sandra, I don't know that, do I? But what I do is I hurt for people who don't participate in giving because I know it's a reflection of a heart issue. Because God is the one from whom all blessings flow. And by giving to him, we're giving into his kingdom and we're doing good work with what he's given us. And we, we are blessed because we have a generous heart. And so in doing so, this is what we're doing. You see, that the last part of this is this. They lay up for themselves a firm foundation, a treasure that's a firm foundation. What does Jesus say? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, rust, and dust corrupt, but lay up for yourselves what? Treasures in heaven. No thief can enter in there and steal that. And so when we are generous, when we excel in doing good, when we are humble with what we have, when we're willing to share, then, listen to this, this is interesting, then they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is not the way to salvation. This is a way of enjoying the salvation that we've been given. You want peace, live out your salvation. And So when we look at God's gifts to us as ways to give him glory, then we will have peace. Now, there's, one, there's a couple more. Financial peace number four, trust God's provision in difficult times. All the rest of these had to deal with how we approach things. Now, this has to deal with how life approaches us. Have you ever gone through a difficult time? I know there's nobody in here old enough to grow up in the Depression, but some of you grew up in the household of those who had grown up in the Depression. What, what, were, they, what were they like? You do not waste food? Very appreciative? I often find that they were very generous. They wanted, they, they wanted to bless their children. Um, but here's the thing that I want you to get. We should trust God's provision in difficult times. Can you think of somebody in the Bible that had to trust God's provision in difficult times? Paul was one of those. Job was one of those. Joseph, by all means. How about Elijah? Go to, a, go to a widow that has nothing and ask her for some soup. Ruth. Yeah, they, they were destitute. All right. Who else? They were in danger for their lives, and who shows up? But three guys with some pretty cool gifts. All right. Was that God's provision? Over and over and over. We cannot find in Scripture a time when God didn't honor his faithful word and take care of his people. And so, if my children ask for bread, will I give them a stone? No. A serpent? No. What will he do? He'll take care of us. Is there anybody in this room where God's not taking care of you to this point? And so, if he's taking care of us to this point, should we trust him? When I was growing up, we, we, we were... We were poor, honestly. We, we didn't live like poor people. We dressed halfway decent, and we lived in a decent home, but we just didn't really have hardly any money. And there were times whenever we were out of money. You've heard me share this before. There was a weekend where we were going to lose our home, and that's not a fun thing to have as a kid to experience. And uh, over the course of that weekend, Mom and Dad pulled us aside and shared this truth with us and told us we needed to pray, and we all prayed. And over the course of that weekend, we had the two largest offerings we ever had at church. That was when Dad had just started up a church, and the, the income paid for the rent and paid for him. And it was a time when we got, an, we got uh, a, a check in the mail from somebody that knew Dad was in the ministry and just wanted to bless him. And by the time Monday came around, the offerings and the gifts were to the penny what Mom and Dad had to pay for the, to the penny what they had to pay for the, for the house payment. I'm going to tell you something. I learned something that day, and I've trusted him ever since for provision. And there's been times he's come through really big for us. We're very thankful. We were talking earlier about paying for college. Somehow God allowed us to pay for college, and God allowed us to have, always have a home, always have food, take a vacation here or there. He's always come through. You need to know that. In God, we trust. He will take care of you. He may not give you all you want, 
better give you all you need. One more. Number five. If you really want financial peace, honor God with your finances. You take your check, you take your bank account, and you say, God, what can I do to bring you glory? Whether in lack or plenty, we give God glory. How can we do this then? Can you think of some ways we can honor God? All right. Tithing is not a a law that we're trying to fulfill. It is a gift. It is a representative gift that says, God, I recognize that all this comes from you. And it just seems like a tenth is a nice round number to say. It even starts with the same number. All right. If you get 100 and you're going to give how much? 10. If you get 10, you're going to give how much? It starts with the same number. So it's an easy thing to remember. God, I'm going to honor you with this gift. I'm going to, I'm going to recognize and I'm going to trust that you're going to do great things with it, but it's all yours anyway. And so the tenth was there in the Old Testament as an example of faithfulness. It is no longer a law. You're absolutely right. But in the New Testament, what's the principle? Jim, what's the principle in the New Testament? You give generously. If you're going to come after me, you've got to what? Give it all up, all right? And now he doesn't demand that from us, but that should be our heart. The rich young ruler went away exceedingly sorrowful because he was very rich. And so what did that demonstrate? He loved his money more than he loved his Lord, all right? And so how can we do this? What else can we do? Give it back out. It's, it's what we just talked about earlier. It's that joy of generosity, right? And it's the peace that comes with it. And so if there's a financial blessing that comes in, you don't sit there and say, what can I do with this for me? You say, what can I do to help other people out? And there's blessing in that. That's what we call abounding in the richness of generosity. Don't want to have to do that. How else can we honor God in our finances? All right, obey when he's moving on your heart. All right, now, by the way, we don't just give to God by putting in the offering plate. We give to God by giving to people in need. All right, now, we, we don't rob the, the tithes from the, or the gifts from the church because the church requires those in order to be able to go forward. But we say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go above and beyond, and I'm going to give an extra blessing. And so here's some of the ways we can honor God. Give to the Lord. Certainly, that's through the church. There's other ways as well. Save for the future. None of us has talked about that. But does the Bible teach us to do that? Go to the ant, you sluggard. What does the ant do? He stores up. And so you really want to have financial peace in your life, have a little money in the bank account. All right? That's a tough thing to do, but it's an important thing to do. And so when we talk about tithe, what does the word tithe mean? What's a percentage on a tithe, typically? Tithe means 10%. And so we could save, we could give God 10% and we could save how much? We could save 90% if we don't eat. We could save another 10%, right? And how long does it take to have a paycheck saved up? Say 10 weeks, all right? You have 10 weeks worth saved up because if you're saving up 10% over the course of 10 weeks, you'd have a whole paycheck in the bank. And then here's the big one we haven't talked about yet, living within our means. All right, the means is what it takes to live. But many of us try to live within our wants. And so we don't honor God when we have more and more wants. It's okay to, it's okay to have some things here or there. But really, God has given us what we have to take care of our means, our needs. And so if we live within our means we will tend to have more financial peace. Any other thoughts or questions? That's funny. I found $5 in a ditch when I was a young man, so I spent the rest of my life looking in ditches. There's truth to that. Um, My brother, when he was little, found coins in, in machines. Well, if you remember back in the day, there used to be a little flap on the on machines where there's a coin return. And one day at the bowling alley, he got his finger in there. He reached in there to try to find a quarter. He pulled his finger out. The flap closed on his finger, and he pulled the end of his finger off. And so he had had found a quarter, and he kept looking for a quarter, right? And so how about this? 
not only living within your means, but how about this? Thanking him for every cent that you have. When's the last time we did that? We, we, th- we, have a, we have a ritual that's a good ritual where we thank him for food. But when's the last time the ch- paycheck came in and you just paused and you thanked him for that? Or that extra $5 in the ditch? Or the fact that your car is working, you don't have to pay for it to be repaired. And so let's go back. God will give us all that we need. And when we learn how to be content with godliness and all that he's given us that we need, then we can find peace and we can certainly glorify him and we can abound in the riches of our generosity. All right. Any other thoughts or questions? Father, thank us. Thank you for how you've given to us, how you provide for us. May we learn to recognize your blessings. May we learn to live within what you've given us. May we learn to be generous. May we learn to be gracious and thankful. And so, Father, we thank you so much that we can have peace in our finances, and we pray that that would be the case for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very much for being here tonight.